We've got a couple more people adding in. Um, let's do it. Cool. Well, day four, right? With Thursday, I'm losing track of the time now this week. Offensive week, that's the whole approach, that's the whole strategy. Um, hopefully you guys are learning something from this week offensively, whether it's um, different things and situations, maybe it's something with your swing, a different verbal cue, just a word that maybe you can take into your game that's going to help you become better. We're all different. We're all different. I think that's what we're really finding out is maybe my philosophy isn't identical to everyone else's philosophy in here, but we're all similar in our ways. And we want to just give you different perspectives and different mindsets into how we can be successful. And there's no right way to do something. There's no cookie cutter way. But on the bases, there is a cookie cutter way. And there is a right way to do something. And that's running them hard. And we're going to get into that here soon. But um, just to recap on this week, some of the, the verbal cues, because I want to just reemphasize them. Because if we took notes, we've got them down. If we didn't take notes, we're going to need a reminder. And so when we get out there in, in the field, maybe it's shoelaces to the baseball. I love that. I'm going to start using that with the youth kids when we do camps. I'm going to do it all the time. Shoelaces to the baseball. That was awesome, Nick. Thank you for that. Give me a fist bump. Get double dab on them. I don't care. Do one of these. It fires me up. And then back hip to the baseball works for me personally. I love the back hip to the ball. Like Nick said, maybe back knee to the ball. Something on that back leg. I'm a left-handed hitter, so my left leg, you righties, right-handed hitters, maybe something on your right leg that you can think about taking into the ball. Uh, maybe it's punching the baseball. Maybe it's punching the pitcher in the face. Maybe it's punching your coach in the face. Maybe it's punching brother or sister in the face or or a crazy grandma that comes over with it and she doesn't give you your cookies or your pie, right? Like maybe it's something like that. We're punching somebody in the face, thinking about being direct to the ball. So I just wanted to recap on those two things. And then what Ronnie really hit on, which was huge, was getting in a good athletic position. Let's just be athletes. At the end of the day, we're all athletes. A lot of us in here play multiple sports, which is awesome. Keep doing it. Keep, keep doing it. Um, whoever just shared their screen, that was a stubby picture, by the way, um, Diego. <laughs> so I, I don't think it even had your name on it, but let me go back to this thing because it just totally made everything go crazy here. Hang on. Cool, we're back to normal. Um, yeah, no, no, just getting back <laughs> getting back to that. You threw me off guard, you threw the 2-0 two, curveball at me. I don't know how to handle it right now, Diego. Come on, man. Um, but you get back to these mindsets and just, hey, let's be athletic. Let's be athletic defensively offensively as a pitcher it's important to be athletic and to use our athleticism to our advantage i'm not going to talk a ton today i just want to lay the groundwork on the base running today's base running and creating defensive mistakes by running the bases hard my philosophy is simple run the bases hard like hard 90s everywhere you go we never walk on the baseball field we never, never, ever, 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 ever walk. You talk about the 10 cardinal sins of baseball. That is, in my opinion, number one, never walk on the baseball field. Like, we never, ever, ever do it. If that's all you get out of this, that is fine. I'm good with that. Run the bases hard. If you're one of the high school kids in here, like Luke or, or some of the older guys, you, like, they're looking for that. The, the scouts that are in the stands that are looking to sign somebody are looking, one, how you handle failure. Two, how hard do you run the bases? Does this person roll over to first base and then jog to first? Or do they take a hard 90 no matter what? So we're thinking about, hey, hard 90s all the time. Run the bases hard. From there, I don't really care what happens. We can get it. We're going to get into a bunch of different mindsets, and, and we'll start, start with that. But I just want to throw that out there. Like, hey, my very first and only philosophy is run the bases hard. Let's make sure we are running hard and with our head up. Sorry, our head up. Our head up at all times. Younger guys and girls, this might be a little tougher because we're trying to get used to touching the base and um, the feel for it, but running with our head up and running the bases hard are essential. Non-negotiables. Talk about non-negotiables of hitting. Those are non-negotiables of base running. Um, where do we want to go with this first, guys? I think we should go with, like, first base, like different yeah. skills at first base, whether it's running through first base or yeah. rounding first base. Yeah. I mean, we I can it. get into that. Um, let's get into some team stuff, Jake, and, and then maybe some things you're doing with your athletes and you're training them. I know for me at the high school that I was coaching at, we were really training the athletes to, one, hit the front part of the bag. you got to hit the front part of the bag when you're running through the base. Yep. Hit the front part of the bag. It's quicker. You save yourself from rolling an ankle, breaking a leg. It's just safer to do, and it's the right way to do it. And then, two, when we round the bases, hitting the inside corner, the front inside corner of the bag. That is key. And I don't care what foot you hit it with. And I know some coaches teach right. Some coaches teach left foot, inside part. I don't care. Whatever's most athletic for you. You get back to Ronnie talking about being athletic. Whatever's smoothest and easiest for you, hitting the front inside part of the base at first base when we're rounding the second is huge. And why? It creates a good angle, a good direction to second base to get us there. Split second quicker. So now we're under that throw instead of out. And then, Jake, I'm going to pass it off to you now so you can take it into that. 
Cool. So yeah, I think, you know, getting to first is huge. When we go home to first, one of the big things that people struggle with sometimes as players is you guys don't understand, like, just because you're not fast, and you're not a base stealer does not mean that you can't create pressure and be a good base runner. Okay. So even if you're the biggest guy in your team, slowest person, doesn't matter. We can still create pressure if we do things right. And a lot of times people forget about you. So you're going to run into stolen bags because they're not paying attention to you. So we can steal some bases on that too. Okay. So tomorrow's going to be all about base stealing, but when we break down home to first, um, there's a few things that we want to make sure you do. Number one, after your swing, okay, I agree with everything Austin said. I don't care what foot you touch it with. Your finish on your swing is going to be slightly different based on pitch location. So you might end up hitting with a different foot. But if you hit the ball on the ground, we start sprinting, right? So we're sprinting to the back. About three or four steps in, it's really important that you peak. Don't stop. You're still running. But you peak to find the ball, okay? We're not going to stare at the ball when we run. But the, the key concept in peaking is you can see if he missed it and now the ball's in the outfield, that's going to change what you do when you get to first, right? Now we're taking the turn. If there's a bobble or he feels it cleanly, then we're eyes back and we're sprinting through that bag, okay? So when you get through the bag, this is the second piece. A lot of times we have, we have a bunch of young players that struggle with this. What they do is they get through the bag and they run as far into right field as they can because they want to show you how fast they are, right? So like if I keep running as far as I can, you guys will think I'm really, really fast. Um, we want to break down as quickly as possible. When we get through the bag, don't break down early. But once we touch and we get through it, we want hips and shoulders to drop. We want head to turn over our right shoulder and we want to chop our feet while we break down. Okay, the key to this is when we look over our right shoulder, most of the throws, if they're a bad throw that gets overthrown, we're going to be able to see the ball over that shoulder. So looking over the left doesn't do anything. We don't want to do that. But as, if you get through first base, you sink your hips, you drop your shoulders, you look the right direction, and you see an overthrow, then we can take second base. Right? But the problem is a lot of times if you get through it and you don't look and you have to wait for your first base coach to tell you to go, it's probably too late. And those are the places you come back to first and you're like, dang, I had that extra base. And it could cost your team a run in a game. So we want to create pressure and be in the right position to break down and then take second on that overthrow. Okay, the second piece of the balls in the outfield, one of the biggest terms that we use that we try to hammer home with our guys um, and our girls is when you hit a ball in the outfield, it's a clean single, okay? That is not your time to like jog to first base and hang out. Okay, it's a great opportunity to create pressure again. So our turn at first base, we're not a quarter of the way. We're not a third of the way. We want you to turn and get as far past first base as you can without getting thrown out and coming back. Okay, so what I mean by that is if you hit the ball in the right field, your turn's not going to be that big because the ball is right front. Okay, but if you hit it down the left field line, now we can take a bigger turn because that guy's not going to come up in the middle of left field and – Chuck a BB back behind you at first base. If he does, that, man, that's a great throw, but that's not going to happen, right? So we can get a bigger turn there. So the reason that we do that is when you get that big turn, if you can get around first base and take that turn, and then you see that lollipop throw that outfielders make to his cutoff, now we can take second base. So when we talk about creating pressure and creating mistakes, what we're looking to do is really, really simple. Every single time that you hit that ball and you take your turn at first base, you're creating pressure because those outfielders now want a throw that they wouldn't really care about. They have to be accurate and precise with their throw because if they're not, you're going to take the bag. Okay, so think about in a game how many singles are hit, right? Call it six, seven singles for your team. That's six or seven extra throws that we now have a chance to create an error on if our players are getting out of the box properly and getting the right turn and creating pressure and willing to take that, that other bag. Okay, here's the problem with it, and this is where everybody struggles. You might do that every single hit that you get in the season, every single, and you might end up taking second three of those all summer. But those three could be huge plays in the game. So although it's not going to be in every at-bat, every, every time we round the base, we get to get, take, get to take second type thing, we need to be in that position every single time to make sure that if that opportunity presents itself, we can take that. All right, so those are our, our two big things that we – um, really teach getting out of the box, okay? Break down, look over the right shoulder if you're getting through it, round it as far as we can without getting thrown out on a back pick or a throw from the outfield behind us on a clean single to the outfield.
That's huge. And, and for some of you guys looking, um, I'm trying to copy paste some of your, your non-negotiables, um, Adam, or like your, your five points about base running into the, the chat. Cause I, I put it to just the host only. So you're sending them to me. Gotcha. So I just want to make sure I got them in there, but there was, a, I <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll copy paste them all day, but there was a, a question from Corbin in here about what does sinking into your hips mean? And it was a great question and it was tough for yeah. me to describe it on a text. So I wanted to say it out loud because there might be somebody in here who doesn't quite understand what that means either, which is awesome. That's good. Great questions. Please ask yes. as many questions as you possibly can. Um, that's how we're going to get better. But when you sink into your hips, you almost think about like, let me see if I can show you without this bright light and all these chairs around here. But uh, I, when you're running into the base, you're running through and when I sink into my hips, I'm getting low with my lower half, like my lower half. I'm not bending with my back. If I'm bending with my t upper half, this is what it looks like. I'm going to headbutt the screen, right? It's almost like I'm sinking, boom, like an elevator, boom, sinking sitting low. into a chair. Exactly. Sitting into a chair. I love that analogy. So you bet you're sitting into a chair as you're running through the base. What that does is it slows our head down, allows us to see the baseball, like Jake was saying, peeking over our right shoulder. Because if there's a bad throw or maybe a ball in the dirt or something that pops up, now we're ready. Boom, we can go. We can, we can push off that backside and go. If we're too tall coming through the bag or if we're bending with that front, that top heavy, if we're really top heavy running through, we might be off balance. We might trip. It's going to give us less of an opportunity and a chance to get to that next bag. So I just want to hit on that real quick. Uh, Adam, what do you got? Because I want you to explain some of these things that you put in the chat and just kind of hit on those points for a little bit. Yeah. Um, the reason I put those in there is because I remember when I was a player, I didn't have much game plan or much thought when it came to base running. It just felt like, all right, I'm on my, I'm on base. It's almost like my job is over and there's no more strategy into it. Well, we, uh, at this, at this point in my life, and, and we as a, as an organization just believe that that's not the case, that the entire goal as a base runner or a base running team is that you're trying to put pressure on the defense to where they make more mistakes. So I posted in the chat here what we believe the absolutes of base running are, and there's five of them. And if you follow these rules and uh, adhere to them and also push your aggressiveness, you're going to make other teams make mistakes. Um, and so number one is like the first thing Jake said, when you get out of the box of peak left, that number one rule there is to always know where the ball is. And it, he notice he said peak. He didn't say stare at the ball the entire time and watch it. It's peak, find the ball, know where it's at. And when you're on the bases and the ball is hit, find the ball, know where it's at. You know, survey the infielder so you understand where the ball is on the field and what your ability is on the base pass based on the ball location. Another one is never make the first or last out at third. This is an absolute no-no, okay? Mainly because uh, if, we're on, if we're on second and we're in scoring position, we're usually one hit away from you scoring. So definitely don't make that last out at third by doing something overly aggressive when it's not necessary because we're going to be more aggressive as coaches when a ball is put into play in the outfield and it's on the ground that we're going to try to send you on that. And you don't necessarily have to take that extra 60 or 90 feet um, with two outs because um, um, we're going to be more aggressive. Always find a way to second base with, le le with two outs because if you're on first base with two outs, now we usually need a minimum of two hits to try to get you in. So if we can be more aggressive and put more pressure on the pitcher and try to get to second base with two outs, again, like we said, we're one, we're one hit away at this point of trying to score. Uh, another one is we always want to tag up on third on a fly ball, even if it's hit over the trees and hit over the scoreboard or hit over the school, tag up. There's nothing that's going to ever be wrong as, as far as tagging up. Um, get back there because you, the last thing you want to do is have a do hit an absolute screaming line drive that ends up getting diving at, uh, a diving catch. And then they double you off on third just because you weren't being disciplined and going back and tagging up. And the last one, and this is probably the biggest one, is you never want to assume that a routine play is going to be made routinely. All right? If you hit a nice shot up the middle, okay, and it seems like it's just going to be a routine single, it's going to go right to the center fielder, and you just slowly get down first base and you're just taking your time looking good for the for the girlfriend and everything and that ball ends up getting bobbled by that center fielder and you didn't take that opportunity that when he bobbled it to go take second base or round it hard look for a bobble and then go then we wasted the opportunity to get a free base and at a young age in baseball free bases in my opinion is arguably the biggest determining factor in who wins baseball games Giving up free bases is the worst thing we can do on defense, but the best thing that we can do on offense. Offense is great, and getting hits is great, 
but the big determining factor there is free bases. So never assume a routine play is going to be made routinely. If there's a can of corn fly ball to left field that you hit, don't just be pissed off about it and excuse my language and throw your bat down on the ground and just not, and not get out of the box, get out of the box hard, round the bag and be on second base. If that ball drops, um, I'm a big believer in the low percentage plays being uh, what usually changes the tide of the game. The stolen bases and, you know, getting on base because of errors or, you know, taking an extra base because of an error, those don't happen a lot. But when they do, they can often turn the tide of an inning and often turn the tide of the game. So those are some of the rules that we follow. That's huge, Adam. That's huge. I, I love that aspect. And, um, just to just to see the thing about hey, let's be aggressive. Let's be aggressive. And we had some questions come in that I want that I want you guys to answer here in a minute too. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and throw the chat on post only because if if fellas, we want to use the chat to to help each other so we can have questions and we can keep growing and learning. But if we're just gonna spam it with highs and, and LLs and all these emojis, <laughs> I get it. It's cool, but we're just going to remove you from the thing because we have a lot of athletes in here who want to get better and grow from this. So we're just doing it for the, the greater good of everyone. So if you have questions, message them to me directly. I'm going to refer them to here. Um, my guys, if you guys have anything that you want to add in on a chat piece, just throw it into me. I'll, I'll put it in there as well. Yep. But Cannon, Ken, who's been a stud, taking freaking stellar notes. Dude, this guy's been just crushing it. He mentioned, um, when is the best time to steal? Now, I uh, – I go back and forth, man. I'm aggressive. I'm aggressive. I'm like, hey, let's yep. go. Like, yep. one, we'll get into stealing third, hopefully, by the end, because third base is the easiest bag to steal for those of you who are 12 and older who are playing travel ball or anybody who's playing travel ball and gets the leads. But I think, personally, the best time to steal is anytime. If you've got the, if you've got the green light, if you've got the go, go. Like, what's the worst that can happen? You get thrown out. Like, at least you know. Now we're learning, hey, maybe the situation I shouldn't go. Maybe 2-0 count with a runners on first and second and nobody out after we've been down two or three runs, maybe that's the time I shouldn't steal. So just knowing your situation. So I guess I shouldn't say go all the time, know your situation, like know what the situation is. If you guys are up five or six and you've got a little bit of swagger going and you're like, Hey, I want to take a bag, take it. But if you're down two or three late in the game and, and there's no point for you to, to take second because your run is meaningless, do not go. Like, hold the phone. Let's go base to base. Let's be smarter. We don't have to go base to base, but let's just be smarter on the base pass. So I think just understanding the situation is key and stealing bases. But I'm, I'm all in. Like, if you want to go, go. If I'm a coach, I'm, you got the green light. Go as much as you want. I don't care how big, fast, slow, out of shape you are. It doesn't matter. Go for it because now you get to learn what you can and cannot do. I'll just kick it off to you guys. Ronnie, if you want to add in anything on that as well. Yeah, I got a couple of things to just kind of piggyback off what you guys said. The first thing, yeah. guys, a cue that I use a lot with my players whenever I was coaching uh, summer travel and even in the college was make the defense stop you. If they're not going to stop yep. you, keep going. Keep rolling, keep going, put the pressure on them. Um, like, for instance, I know we used to take a lot of bases with an outfielder that barely bobbled a ball. So he kind of just bobbles it a little bit, picks it up, throws in. We're already at second base, it's over. Um, we got a guy in scoring position. So now we really don't have that pressure of trying to steal a bag. We can but we're already in scoring position, so that helps. So if the defense doesn't stop, you keep rolling. Um, that's the first yeah. thing I got. The second thing is, and I, I like to bring in the college aspect and the high school aspect to it a lot of times, but when I would go and recruit a high school kid when I was coaching in college, i bring a stopwatch with me. And I want you guys to understand that stopwatch is meant for one thing and one thing only. When that guy puts the ball in play, how hard are they running from home to first base? I don't care how fast he is. I could care less how fast he is. But I want to know if that's a sprint or I, I want to know if that's a jog. And so for a lot of you guys, the, the coaches that are watching you, and even even in, even the modified the youth level, like your coaches may have a stopwatch. You never know what that's for. And a lot of times we'll document even with our own players that we want to know what their home to first is in practice because depending on how fast they run in practice, if I'm not getting those same numbers in a game, I know they're dogging it on me. So just know that, guys, that, that a lot of people will, will be watching to see how hard you're running from home to first. That's a big thing. So it's a big deal for a lot of you high school guys. Um, and then the last piece that I have with this is with the stealing bases, and I know we'll get a lot of this in, in tomorrow, but as for stealing bases, I like to use the leg lift versus slide step rule. So, so for you guys that understand, the guys that are pitching, um, if, if the guy's going to lift his leg up high, that's an easy, easy tell to steal second base. For, for that guy to lift his leg up, stride, make a pitch, catcher to pop up and, and throw an absolute seed and a dot to second base is going to be tough. So, so as soon as he lifts that leg up high, you're gone, right? Now, if he has a quick move to home plate, now it might keep us back a little bit. But any guy that, that lifts his leg up high, 
uh, I'm going for sure. Um, and for the softball players too, I definitely want to mention this for the softball players that are stealing bags. Um, understand that, that you have to know what the catcher's like. Do they throw from their knees? Do they like to pop up? How's their arm? Um, you know, how's their glove work? Because a lot of times if they're really boxy with their glove, and what I mean by that is that they don't stick pitches very well, then that it's going to be harder for them to transfer the, the ball to their throwing arm to, to get rid of it. So for the softball players in here, understand that look a lot at the catcher and see how their footwork is, because if they don't move very well, you're probably gonna be able to steal a lot during that game as well. So I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah. Thanks for adding that in there, Ronnie. Thanks for adding that in there. Cause I, I didn't even think about that aspect of, Hey, how, how, what's the difference there? You know, like there's some differences there as well. Um, Jake, do you want to add anything to the softball side of things? I know you work with a lot of softball athletes as well. Yeah. I mean, when we talk base running, non-negotiables, they're all the same for softball where it differs, of course, is stealing bases with the rules there. Um, Honestly, what, what we do a lot on the softball side or what we try to tell our coaches is really simple. You should know um, every girl's 60-foot time, right? How long it's going to take them to get from first to second. And if we stopwatch between innings, the one throw that catcher gets, so we know from release of the pitch to catcher throwing it down, we can compare that time to our girls' times. And if our girls' times are better than their time consistently, then it's a guaranteed go. We're going to run and make them be perfect on that. So it, it's a little bit easier. There's less variables in softball. Not easier to steal the bag, but easier to determine if you should go or not go. Um, whereas baseball, there can be more variables with leadoff length and pitcher looks. And there's a million different things that you can look for on that side. So, you know, and I know we'll get into to stealing bases specifically tomorrow, but to go off of that that question that came through um there's a couple key counts that we always run in um and then there's a, a few counts that we rarely run in right so 3-0 we're not running okay we're not going anywhere because it's going to be a fastball hitters probably not swinging um so we're not gonna when we're up that far in the count we're not going to create an out on the bases when we're in a great spot to hit a ball okay so 3-0 we, we pretty much don't go anywhere 3-2 um, if you're, if you are on base and there's a force out from where you are, we're stealing. I don't care if you're the slowest guy on the team, because we put a huge emphasis on contact and our ability to battle with two strikes. So if you're a hitter three, two, you know, that guy three, two, less than two outs, you know, we're stealing. So that does two things for us. One, the defense knows we're going to go because they know our structure, which is great because now pitcher is going to try to be quick to the plate. He's not going to be focused as much on, on how accurate he is. Um, and the defense is moving, right? So now we're creating bigger holes on the defense when we're trying to slap at a ball and put something in play with two strikes um, to where now there's a bigger gap in the field that we can potentially exploit. So that's a good time to go. Um, 0 2 one 2 are good times to steal, right? Breaking ball counts, good time to go. Um, and some of it for us, and we'll get into this heavily tomorrow, but we do a few different types of leadoffs. Um, we know exact pitcher timing. Uh, or exact pitcher amount of looks before they go home. So we work off of a few different variables. There's nothing better than stealing a bag when the catcher is a stud with a cannon because then the catcher gets mad and that ruins their at-bats. So we steal more on the pitcher than the catcher um, because pitchers are creatures of habit. So for those of you who are pitchers, tomorrow will be really good for you when we get into some of that um, because you'll understand from the base running side what good base running teams are trying to do against you when you're on the mound. All right. So that's kind of an interesting one to go through, but Adam touched on something that I have a, a fun story to tell and um, want to talk through a little bit, but um, coach, uh, coach McDonald from Louisville, he came out to, to Indiana. He was giving a clinic and he was talking <laughs> about base running a little bit and he was talking about tagging up. Right. So when you are tagging up from third, we mentioned always tag up on third on a fly ball, with less than two outs. Um, when you do that, you need to make sure that your eyes are facing the field and the ball. Okay, we see a lot of youth players that turn around to where they're staring at their third base coach and they have no vision of the field. Okay, so what Louisville does, if that happens, because it still happens at the college level, if they see that guy on third looking at the third base coach, their third baseman will stand right there and about two feet before the ball actually enters that outfielder's glove, third baseman will lean over and say, go, and try to get that guy to leave early. Right, because your job as a base runner is to always know where the ball is. So if you don't, then as a defense, we have the ability to manipulate what you do and make you make mistakes because you're not paying attention where you should be. All right, so that's the D1 level. Louisville's always really, really good. And they're doing that at that level. 
Um, and we've gotten some kids on it. The other one that we do, okay, that you need to make sure you peek on when you are stealing, make sure you peek to see if there's contact or not from the hitter. Uh, because our shortstop, if ever there's contact when someone's stealing, he comes in hands up saying, hey, foul ball, foul ball, foul ball. That way, if that runner's not paying attention, he goes back to first. And then suddenly we have two guys on first base or he doesn't go first to third on single. Okay, so you as a base runner, it's really, really important as you get up in levels um, to know where the ball is at all times because those things can drastically change an inning um, if you're not paying attention and the defense tells you what to do with that. It's worked at the pro level. I mean, there's, there's cool videos out there of Jeter doing that and people doing that faking double plays, like all that stuff um, to get base runners. So really, really important um, to know where the ball is. I think finding a way to second base is a good one to talk through on these. Um, you know, when we say find a way to second base with two outs, that doesn't mean you're just going to like get in a rundown and see if you can make it, but it's a game of percentages. Okay. And this is what we try to explain to players. If, you have an 85% chance to steal second safely, we're going to go, right? Because now, sure, 15% of the time you get thrown out, but the other 85%, you're there and you're one hit away. So we're going to go, right? But if the percentages are low, then we don't want to take that risk, okay? So the only time that we would ever be okay with making the last out of an inning at third base, and this is more for the youth levels, if the hitter behind you, hasn't hit anything all weekend, right? Like you're, you're in the semis on Sunday and that dude struck out like nine times all weekend. He hasn't put a ball in play and there's two outs in the inning. If your percentage chance to steal third and potentially get an overthrow to score is better than that hitter's percentage chance to put a ball in play, then, then let's risk it. Let's go for it and see what happens. If you make an out, you make an out. But throws to third from catchers do sometimes end up in the outfield. So that's the only time for trying to force an overthrow um, and we don't trust the hitter that's up, then we'll take that risk and try to take third there. But most of the time we don't want to do that. Okay. The percentage game, this is, this is the last thing I'll say for now, but the percentage game is so big for you to understand as a player. Okay. Because for some reason we look at batting averages different than regular percentages. Okay. And here's what I mean by that. If I'm on second and Adam's coming up to hit, right? And Adam hits all singles. It's like I do. in golf. Like he has no pop, zero pop whatsoever, but he hits a lot of singles. So let's say he's hitting 350, right? So with me on second, there's a 35% chance that Adam gets a hit and that I get driven in, right? Let's say Austin's on deck. Okay. And Austin's hitting 400 and he does hit some taters, right? We've got that lefty stick up there. Anybody who plays first base is hitting taters. They don't even care about defense. There's, All day. No defense today. For them to hang out. <laughs> this is offense so, week, baby. <laughs> except for you, so, Jonas, so, if you're in here. <laughs> right. So, so let's look at this. Adam gets a single, right? I'm on second base. I'm rounding third. Okay. And that center fielder is picking the ball up. And as a coach, I determine, you know, it is 50, 50, if I get thrown out or not, if, if I send that runners a 50, 50 chance. Okay. I'm looking at it as a coach, Austin's on deck hitting 400. That's a 40% chance that he drives me in. If I send that runner, it's a 50% chance that he scores. Where are my odds better? Right? So a lot of times that's what good coaches are working through in their mind. It's like our percentage chance is better. We're going to take a risk. And if I get thrown out, I get thrown out. We live with it. But sometimes you guys as runners, you question those decisions from your coaches and then you don't go all out. You kind of go, but you stop for a second and try to find the ball and make your own decision. If your coach tells you to go and you get thrown out, that's not on you. You didn't make a mistake. You listened and they made a good play, right? Sometimes other teams will make good plays, but a lot of times it's a numbers game. It doesn't always work out. If it did, it wouldn't be fun, right? It's a risk. We're going to take those chances. Um, and coaches will do their best to determine when the right time to go or not go is. So your job is to just be in a position that you give your coach those options, right? So you, he has the option to send or stay based on your read and your jump and those things. And then, you know, with that, with read and jump, there's a lot of players that forget one big thing pre-pitch, and that's checking where your outfielders are. Okay, so if I'm on a base and I don't know where the outfielders are playing, it's a lot more difficult for me to get a good read off the bat of if a ball is going to drop or not. So that's depth, that's location, what's open, where are the gaps, because um, we want to get as good of a jump and as good of a read as we can on the bases. So make sure no matter what base you're on, you're checking outfield location and depth um, 
infield you normally see because you're in there, but outfield can be difficult to see unless you like actually have the intent of looking back there to see it. But that's, that'll make you a really good base runner and give you the ability to go first to third or second to home on a single um, if your jumps are better. So if your average speed, jumps become even more important. So that's a good place to focus for you guys. Yeah, and, I, and I'll add to that, what Jake was talking about reads, there's reads all over the field, okay? And when we talk about making reads as baseball players and base runners, a read is not something happens, your coach tells you to go and you got there safely, okay? So to talk about some stuff Ronnie talked about as far as catchers, one big thing we talk about when we're saying, you know, with two outs, try to find ways to second base, that – only way it doesn't have to be like you have a straight steel sign your coach told you to go on this pitch you got to find ways to make reads and get there and one way that we can do that is understanding that catcher's ability of not just his arm but his ability to block a ball okay so we always tell our players to read a ball in the dirt we don't need you to read a pass ball we know that if that ball gets past the catcher you're going to go take second base all right but if you know that that catcher is not a good blocking catcher and by that i mean not necessarily just getting past balls or letting the ball by them, but not being able to control that block and keep it close to them and get up and field it quickly. If you're watching in the bullpen or in between innings and seeing what that catcher does when that ball is in the dirt, if they're a poor blocking catcher, we want you guys as base runners to be reading the trajectory of the ball and look and see if that ball is going to go in the dirt. And if it does, read knees. Yeah, read knees and go. Don't read the pass ball and then go. We can we know we can get there if the ball's at the backstop. But if that catcher is going to drop down to his knees and you're a, an average or better base runner, we need to be making that read on your own and taking off to the next bag as long as you're not putting yourself in danger of getting out at third base. So read the catcher's knees because – we talked about those low percentage plays. It's a very low percentage of the time that a catcher is able to uh, read the ball in the dirt, block it properly, keep it close, get up, pick it up, go throw the ball down in the second phase, uh, the ball caught and a tag applied to get you out, all right? But what we can't do is have you guys hesitate in times you're supposed to be aggressive and wait for that coach to tell you to go. You have to be cognizant of that and aware, again, that your job is not over just because you're on base. All right, You have times where you have to be more aggressive on your own and make those reads and go try to take that extra base as opposed to your coach instructing you to do so. Now, I'll add to that a little bit and just say that, like, with Jake and what Adam both have said, is that understand that there are different counts that different pitches are going to be thrown. So, for instance, like, we can actually realize, okay, so it's an 0-2 count. This is traditionally a breaking ball count. I'm going to anticipate that this ball is going to be thrown in the dirt somewhere because the, they don't want it to be close to the plate for the guy to, to take a good swing and two strikes. So I'm going to, I'm going to anticipate that. I'm going to over-anticipate that. And as soon as I see that ball going close to the ground, I'm off, right? And, and another thing that I want to add into this is let's also understand what the percentage of, of throwing runners out is too. I mean, I'm a catching guy. I do a lot of stuff for catchers. I was a catcher for a little while. Like, I'm only throwing out 30% of the runners that I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm throwing against, right? So understand that base dealers, you're probably going to be pretty successful if you take off a good amount because a lot of times we are stealing off the pitchers. But the catcher also is trying the best that he can to throw guys out. But that percentage, even the best in the world right now, are 34 35%. So any ba out of 100 base dealers, 65 of them are safe. So we can take our chances and take off and, and take extra bases because catchers really aren't throwing that many guys out only because they're stealing off pitching, right? And I thought that that was big, big to add in there to anticipate dirt ball reads based off of the count as well. Yeah, we always say the terminology we use for that when we're on base uh, bases as coaches, like if we think there's going to be a breaking ball count, especially when we're, you know, picking up on sequence, we always just say, hey, read something loose. You know what I mean? Look for that ball to get loose from the catcher or not even if you it's it's hard also to throw guys out if you don't receive the ball well. OK, if the ball is pulling you out of pulling the catcher out of the zone. It's hard to get good footwork and get good uh, direction behind that baseball and take and throw that ball to the back. So you guys can do your part to put pressure uh, on on the guys by doing those things and also adding in bluffs okay so if it's a two strike count and they're going to be trying to hit a corner adding in a bluff to make it to where that catcher doesn't necessarily stick that pitch he's going to come up and maybe try to act like he's gonna have to throw because of your bluff all of that stuff is big because you are putting pressure on the defense and taking them out of their comfort zone and not allowing them to play their game they're having to adjust everything based off of what you're doing on the base pass which is something that they're probably not used to
It's huge, man. You're putting them on their heels. If you can put yep. the defense on their heels, it's big time. You put the pressure on them. A couple of things I just want to reiterate is, one, you are your own best coach. You're your own best coach. You can't rely on your – on your on your third base or first base coach to always make the right decision like at the end of the day you've got to have some feel and you've got to have some ideas of hey i'm my own best coach i need to know where the ball is at all times and i need to keep my head up and be aware of it if i hit a laser to the left center gap i should be thinking two out of the box for me even being a first baseman like i said first baseman unite and adam sends to me yeah the buffet line <laughs> which is classic because hey that's what we're doing after we celebrate our dingers and tears hey, i'll join you. let's go um but like hey we might want to eat but guess what i'm thinking triple i'm thinking triple because i don't care how good the outfielder is i'm gonna force them to make a throw i'm gonna run in your face it was like a sense of pride for me was hey i'm gonna run in your face make you throw me out i don't care how good you are you're not gonna throw me out so running the base is hard, having a sense of pride when you run them and being your own best coach. And then something else that I wanted to hit on is Cannon mentioned in the chat, he said SOIL. Um, and it's like SOIL is just a, a, an acronym for SIGN. Let me go double check what it was. SIGN, check your outfield, check your infield, take your lead. That is freaking stellar, dude. I like that That's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. And it sticks like, okay, let me get my SIGN. Let me check my outfield, check my infielders, take my lead. Now I know where everything is. You talk about clearing up confusion, right? You go into a math test and you want to you wanna get 100%. Well, you've got to study a little bit. <clears throat> and you've got to know what you're going up against. Just like on the bases, same, th same deal. You've got to look and see where people are because if that ball is hit to left field and that left fielder, if you think he's in the gap, but really that left fielder is down the line and it goes right down the line and you think you're going to score, but now you can't because you didn't know where that person was. Knowing where your outfielders are is huge. Knowing where everybody is on the infield and the outfield is huge. But if you just want to simplify it, check your outfield at first base, second base, third base at all times. It's going to be huge for you, and you're going to be able to get that extra 90 feet. And extra 90 feet wins games. Think of the best teams in the, in, the, in the league, not even in the league, in college and in high school. They win one-run games. They win one-run games. And one-run games are, are decided by 90 feet almost every single time, like over 60 to 70% of the time. A pass ball, stealing the bag, getting a good lead. Some, like any of that, making an error, not making an error. It's huge. So, so just understanding that, hey, we've got to win one-run games. If we can win one-run games, we got to run the base as well. So I just wanted to re-emphasize those points. Anything else you guys want to add? You're, you're setting it up for this video that I, I just texted Adam to upload for me or to share because I'm on my phone and it won't. But, um, nice, Adam, perfect. if you could get that up, I'm going to talk through something real quick. But I just sent these over to you too, Austin. But we break down – a few huge factors, right, that really determine if and when you should take the next base um, or really push the envelope on it. So one is your speed, right, runner speed, um, always an important one. But we look at outs in the inning, okay, what inning you're in, what's the score, how hard was the ball hit, okay, what direction was it hit. So, like, in compared to that fielder, if they're going to have to spin before they throw it in, you have more time than if their momentum is coming. Um, Place and batting order, right? Who's coming up? Is it your worst hitter or your best hitter? That's going to help determine what you do. And then how fast are the base runners around you and where are they, right? You can't run off the guy in front of you. If he's a big lug and you're really fast, You just because you get to third, if he's still standing there, you didn't accomplish anything. That's not great. I do that in MLB The Show all the time. I'll, like, send Ty Cobb to second, and I still got big poppy standing there. It's like this didn't work out how I was hoping. So you got to be careful of that. But Austin mentioned a great thing of, you know, 90 feet determines a game. And there's been two times in the ALCS in the last five or six years um, that the same play has happened. <laughs> and I want to show you the play um, because it's really good to look at from the defensive side and from the offensive side. Um, when this play happened, we're going to show you the, the video from the Royals. Um, Lorenzo Cain was on first. He was in his prime real fast at the time. Eric Hosmer was up. And we were working with Ned Yost, the manager of the Royals at the time, and he told us after they had scouting that every time Jose Bautista fielded a ball to his glove side, he would always throw it to second, no matter the situation. Didn't He just didn't carry it, always just get it into second. So the play that you're going to watch was eighth inning of the ALCS. The Royals were down in the series. They ended up winning this game and winning the World Series that year. But Lorenzo Cain scored on a single from first base. Right. That's ridiculous when you just say that, like scored from first on a single in a major league baseball game. But Hosmer hit a line drive to right field going towards the line and Jose Bautista picked it up and threw it into second. 
well, on contact because Kane, he soiled, right? He, he checked the outfield. He checked the infield. He got his lead. He knew his sign. He saw contact. He took off. He knew the ball was going to drop. And dude just never stopped at third because he expected that throw to go to second where it did. And he scored from first base on a single. So, Adam, if you have this and can I do. screen share. Yeah, let's pull this thing up and show it. And this is, this is the highest level of baseball, right? This is Major League Baseball playoffs. And when we talk base running, this gets me fired up. When we talk base running and the ability to take the extra base, like it's not just stealing a base. It's this too. Yeah. Austin, so, can you give me permission, bub? Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah let me give you permission. Um, but before I give you permission, Tyler Wells said in here, don't remind me of the dark times as a Blue Jays fan. <laughs> that is so funny. Uh, okay. I'll show you exactly what happens when you don't do the right things. Giving up free That's base. Right. Tyler, we apologize ahead of time, but we really don't apologize. You're going to have to relive this with yeah. us. We can meet. If you, need we to can look meet away for, if you need to look away for a minute, just look away. All right. So, can everybody view, see this okay? Yes. Okay. I don't my know view, if sound is, play, but we'll see. Here we go. This is – this is the seventh pitch of the at-bat. So he's battled, which means fielders should have had enough time to think about what to do with the ball, right? So we got a single to right field, relatively deep. He picks it up there. Kane just never, doesn't even slow down, right? He knew throw one into second. He beats the throw home because they weren't lined up to stop that run. That's the winning run wow. late in the game, right? So it's crazy to see. It's a well-hit ball but a clean right. single, right? And, and, and based on the situation and Kane knowing his situation as a base runner, being prepared mentally before the play happened, he was in a position to go advance three bases on a single to win a game, which really changed the whole momentum of the series and was a big play that propelled the Royals to win it all. So when we talk base running, these are the types of things that make a huge difference that you can do. Um, yeah, and this is a good one. There's a lot that are bad too. Adam, yeah, are we able to see like right now? Boom! Can we see that where he hit the bag? Whoever's drawing the screen, please just cut that out for us, please. Otherwise, go go back movies. to where Kane I'm hits. Go back third. to where he hits yep. third base. Yeah, where he hits third base. Because I want to see where his foot is on 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 the bag. Boom! Right. Pause game strong. Look at that. That man. is he's, strong. He's, Look at that. Wow! Look at that. Inside Look the part of the bag. Shoulders shoulders already squared to the plate. Yeah. Great turn. Yeah, and, and look at how his chest is leaning forward. Okay, I see this a lot with uh, when a athletes are, don't understand how to accelerate well, well through their running. Okay, if you are starting straight standing up uh, when you're running, uh, it's going to be nearly impossible for you guys to get to top speed. Okay, Kane can't get to top speed because there's not enough room on the base pass for him to do that because he's running in a circle, but he's continuously driving forward with that positive lean forward. That's a big deal, and he's powering through on the inside part of the bag. I don't know if you That's guys huge. Knew, I don't know if you guys knew this, but did you know that Lorenzo Kane didn't start playing baseball until he was a junior in high school? No. That's crazy. That's why that's why guys being an athlete is so important because yep. you just never know when it's gonna click for you. But but obviously he was able to kind of figure it out and this is this is perfect. Oh yeah. I, and, and guys, out, I also want to point this out too. And of how uh, the one of the big reasons we Jake and I talked about before about the not playing with fear and how important that is. Look at what inning it is. It's the bottom of the eighth. It's a tie game, right? Kane knows how fast he is and that he's going to probably be able to score from third on any ball that's hit in the outfield. But there's no outs in this inning. He goes from first to third with no outs in the inning on a single. I know first from to home on no outs in the inning on. Uh, on a single because he's not playing with fear of making mistake. He's trusting his ability and he knows how fast he is. He's trusting his scouting report and he's doing this as the go ahead run in the bottom of the eighth with no outs. And he's being that aggressive, right? So Yost talked about how he made it to where he, he does not allow his players to play with fear because then they're not going to play to their best of, his, of the ability. If, if Lorenzo Cain played with fear, he wouldn't be able to use his best weapon, which is speed, and aggressiveness. Absolutely. And that's, that's yeah. Good. Go ahead, Jake. Go ahead and then let it rip. No, that's this is huge. That's this is so huge, cool. Yeah, that's a huge piece of, of playing fearless. And the other thing that it does that you guys have to realize, let's say that happens in the second inning of a game, not the eighth. What are those outfielders doing the rest of the game when they pick up a ball? Right? Like now they're rushed because you've created pressure and they don't want that to happen again. 
So you've put fear into the opponent. Most of the people talk about putting fear into opponents when you're hitting. But we can do it from an offensive side, even if you're not the one at the plate, because now we're adding pressure to the way that they have to play the game every single play. We had a player, it wasn't so good. We were in the semifinals of, of a huge national tournament, um, run around first, tie game, and there's a routine fly ball to center the field, and he starts jogging, ball drops, he gets thrown out at home because he didn't take off off the bat with two outs. Right. So as much good as that video is, we see it in the youth levels a lot on the wrong side because you guys assume that plays are going to be made and you don't want to be that guy who makes that last out because you decided that you were too tired to run or you thought it was going to be made and you were too cool to, to actually take off. So make sure you're controlling the things that you can. And running hard is an easy thing to control. It's, it's something you have all the control in the world with. 100 percent Let, let's recap we've got about eight minutes left here and, yeah. and i just want to kind of recap so we can simplify it for everyone and we can put some things in the chat but i think number one is like know the game one like understand the game like understand where the outfielders are like be a be a learner of the game pay attention right run with your head up run the bases hard at all times and here's my favorite one that I haven't mentioned it yet, but one of my coaches mentioned this to me when I was in college, and it was it just hit home. Like he said this to us all, and he's like, "Look, guys, and we did base running all the time. You think when you get to college, you don't base run? It's the first fifteen to thirty minutes of every day. And guess what? There's no ball involved usually, so it doesn't count against any time. So you can get around some things. So if you want to play college yep. baseball or softball, you're going to be base running a lot. Trust me, it never gets you're never going to stop. So take pride in it. Like use it as a tool, like a weapon. You talk about how do we separate ourselves. Maybe that's an extra tool that I can use to get me to the next level. But he mentioned something that was hilarious, and, he, and, it, and, it, and it hits home. He says, you can't be half pregnant on the bases. You can't be half pregnant on the bases. And this is what he means by it. Look, there's, it's impossible, right? If, if you're going to go, go. Like, if you've made the decision to go, go. If you've made the decision to stay, stay. But you can't be indecisive. The minute we get indecisive as base runners, we get out. And we caught, we make we make stupid outs, and then we cost our team runs or whatever may happen. Like we we lose innings because we make the wrong decision, because we weren't decisive and clear on our actions. Like Cannon said, the soil. He checked his outfielders. He had his sign. He knew exactly what he wanted to do and his objectives. So now when something happens, he understands. Hey, I got I got the competitive edge, right? I've got that extra tick on the defense. So now I'm going to score like Lorenzo Cain because I don't have to pick my head up and check where the ball is because I know exactly where that right fielder is on a base hit. So I'm going to score from second. Or on a fly ball to left field, I know that he's a little off the, uh, off the line, and I know it's his, his momentum's taking him to center field on that fly ball. So instead of being camped under it to where he can throw me out, now I know he's going to be off balance and I can take that extra bag. This is what wins games. Not your awesome power, not the 99 with the driveline balls, chucking them backwards and forwards and up and down and off your face. Like that stuff doesn't do anything to win games. It looks good on a radar gun. All the cool spin rates and the, the contact points and stuff, that's great. It's good for the parents. It looks awesome for mom and dad to check it out. Wow, my, my son's hitting 95 off the tee. Oh, my gosh. But how does that translate to a game, to winning games? Coaches want athletes who are going to help them win games. Base running is a way that they, they know – all the coaches in here know that that's going to help their team win games. If you can help your team win games, you're going to keep playing. And if you yep. keep playing, you give yourself the best chance to keep on playing. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Whatever recap you guys got, yeah, away, man. That's, I'm done. <laughs> no, I'll add to that that um, the, like that's one great way to try to get yourself noticed on your roster. I mean, like there's very few guys that are recognized as, hey, that guy's a good base runner. You know what I mean? That's that guy's a big time base runner for us, and that's going to find ways for you to be in the lineup on a regular basis, basis because the coach knows when you get on base, good things are going to happen. And I will reiterate that by saying that if you want to be a good base runner, you have to practice it. It's just like hitting. It's just like pitching. It's just like anything else in baseball. If you want to be good at it on a regular basis and good at it in games, you have to find time to work on it. I, I do this thing where I help athletes, help baseball players try to improve on their 60 time. And within that program that I, that I work with them, I give them at home homework that they have to do and running drills that they have to do in order to do it. And I tell them, hey, it's just like hitting. If you want to be a better hitter, 
You got to take batting practice. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a better base runner. You got to do some running practice. I don't want you going out there and running tons of miles or anything like that, but it's something you have to work on and practice within your practice plan, um, you know, with your team or at least on your own in order to be good at it. You don't just go out there, learn a little bit of strategy and be a little more aggressive and become a good base runner. You got to practice, hey, reading balls in the dirt, practice your jumps, practice your leads, practice your bluffs, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, that will in turn give you another skill that I would say it's one of the lowest practice skills in all of baseball. Everybody focuses on everything else. If you can add that into your arsenal, you're going to be a very valuable player for your team. I think that, yeah, I think that's huge. If, if you want to be good at it, take pride in it, right? You hear Ricky Henderson, everybody knows of him as a base runner. He took pride in it, right? Terrence Gore has a world championship ring and dude had like eight at bats the whole season. He took pride in his base running, right? Gerard Dyson, Billy Hamilton, there's all these guys that steal a bunch of bags, but that's part of their identity as a player. So if you want that to be part of your arsenal, then you have to practice it and take pride in it just like anything else. Huge. <laughs> Yeah, upgrade your toolkit. Let's upgrade our toolkits. This is upgrading our toolkit every single day. As coaches for us, we get to teach some of this stuff and reiterate it. So now we're getting better. As athletes, being able to hear some of this, it's good to hear it. But but lesson number two, you've got to put it into practice and take action yep. and actually use some of this stuff. So the ones of you who are writing this down and who are actually like paying attention and, and taking this seriously you don't have to be fully locked in but just taking most of this seriously as much as we can you're going to get better and you're going to come out of this not even recognizing who you are you gonna be like wow i'm doing this and your coach is going to be like oh my gosh what happened to you like wh wh where'd you get this like what are you why are you different at it how are you better after two months of not playing well coach i had listened and i took notes and look at these notes look at what i've been taking down can we practice this uh absolutely if i have, a, if I have one of my athletes come to me and say hey let's practice this 100%, let's go. Let's get better, right? Let's keep growing. So um, this was awesome, guys. Remember, always run the bases hard. Always run the bases hard. Always run with your head up. If you don't remember anything else, run hard. Run with your bases or with your head up and pay attention. Pay attention to the things around you. There's a lot of signals around us that we can pick up on if we just open our eyes and just look at what's around our surroundings. And that's on and off the field, too. So keep yep. trusting your ability. Keep pushing hard. And remember, hashtag full uni Friday tomorrow. Let's go. I'm full uni up. Friday. Full, full, full uni Friday. Friday. And we will be going in depth on stealing bases, different ways that you can do that based on your speed and how to maximize your ability to, to do that. So nothing gets me fired up more than full uni Friday, though. <laughs> let's go let's go winners get a hat caleb i still have to send you your hat but winners are getting an mlu hat so there's three weeks left so if you come prepared if you come rocking your swag and if you do wear whoever wore that uh the chain last time i forget who it was uh, <laughs> mason i think it was maybe mason but wore a chain you might be in the front running as long as there's stirrups on. Just remember that. <laughs> Two chains. Two chains. Find right me an Austin Byler jersey. Hey, if you found a if you found a Byler jersey, you win. You get my whole wardrobe. You know? I'm gonna send you everything I got. You got my bed sheets. You got my books. You got everything. I'm good. I'm good on the bed sheets. <laughs> see you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. And yes, uh, Carter, every Friday, full uni Friday. Even if it's just and the top, do your thing. Tyler, I just got Tyler. I got your message. I'll get back to you. But I just got it right now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you guys. We'll see you guys.